Good afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business this afternoon is a statement by John Swinney on the provisional outturn for 2013-14. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement, and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. Cabinet Secretary, if you're ready, ten minutes, please. President Officer, I'm grateful for the opportunity to inform Parliament of the Scottish Government's provisional financial outturn for 2013-14. The Government attaches the greatest priority to the effective management of the public finances, and the information I set out to Parliament today is further demonstration of the Government fulfilling this commitment. It is essential that we maximise the value of every public pound as we take forward programmes to support economic recovery and deliver high-quality, efficient public services. Today's outturn figures must also be set in the context of continued UK Government reductions to the Scottish Budget. Since 2010-11, the Scottish Government has managed an almost 8% real terms decline in public spending, whilst supporting our economy and investing in public services. As a demonstration of this Government's sound financial management, I can report to Parliament that within the fiscal departmental expenditure limit, the fiscal DEL, the resources over which this Parliament has discretion, the provisional outturn for 2013-14 is expenditure of £28,238 million against a limit of £28,383 million, delivering an overall cash underspend of £145 million. This reflects an underspend of £144 million on resource and £1 million on capital budgets. There is also a provisional outturn underspend of £31 million in respect of financial transactions, as I confirmed in the draft budget 2014-15 last September, these resources will be carried forward to support help to buy in 2014-15, reflecting the fact that the scheme commenced partway through financial year 2013-14. Finally, in respect of non-cash DEL, there is a provisional outturn underspend of £111 million after taking account of the pre-planned budget exchange carry forward of £42 million to support our plans in 2014-15. This non-cash underspend reflects differences between expected accounting adjustments and actual amounts. For example, £56 million of this total relates to less than anticipated write-down of the carrying value of the Income Contingent Repayment Student Loan Book. The non-cash underspend does not reflect resources which could be spent on public services. To summarise, by using the budget exchange mechanism to carry forward £218 million, the overall underspend based on the provisional outturn for 2013-14 is £111 million of non-cash resources, which represents less than 0.4% of the total 2013-14 Her Majesty's Treasury budgets. None of this underspend represents any loss of spending power on behalf of the Scottish Government. At the time of the spending review in 2011, I made clear to Parliament that I would plan our public expenditure using budget exchange facilities over a three-year period to level out fluctuations in the resources available to us. I estimated that would require me having to find £57 million to support our plans in 2014-15, and I confirm that this has been achieved as part of the £145 million fiscal DEL underspend. As the spending review has progressed, other financial commitments have emerged that Parliament has agreed that we must try to address. One of the most significant has been the mitigation of welfare reform measures, in 2013-14 and 2014-15, these measures include funding for the Council Tax Reduction Scheme, which is benefiting over 500,000 people, support for the Scottish Welfare Fund and the increased funding of discretionary housing payments, and we will use resources carried forward in the budget exchange mechanism to fulfil our commitment to mitigate the effects of welfare reform where we are able to do so. Our financial commitment to welfare mitigation is now £260 million over the period 2013-14 to 2015-16. And I welcome the broad support Parliament has shown in this area of our activity. Our choices about public spending continue to be focused on the economy. We have seen continual growth for almost two years and rising confidence across both households and the private sector. The economy is growing, employment is rising and business confidence continues to increase. We are continuing to support employment, including by maintaining our record commitment to modern apprenticeships and working with our local authority partners to take forward our commitment to early learning and childcare. Going forward, our priority will be to work with our delivery partners in following up the report of the Wood Review. I have already confirmed additional resources of £12 million will be available in 2014-15 to support initial work in this area. 
While the outlook remains positive, Scotland's economy will face headwinds, such as the relatively subdued recovery in key export markets like the European Union, as well as legacy effects from the financial crisis that continue to take time to unwind. In response to continuing challenges in the housing market, we confirmed in April and May further allocations amounting to £50.3 million in fin financial transactions funding for the Help to Buy scheme in 2014-15. This brings overall investment in Help to Buy Scotland to £275 million, bringing substantial support to the construction sector in Scotland. At the same time, the Scottish Government has continued to provide support to Scottish businesses and households through the Small Business Bonus Scheme and our support for a social wage and a council tax freeze. Throughout the recession and the recovery, this Government has taken the, the firm view that infrastructure investment has a central part to play in boosting the economy. Today's outturn figures demonstrate how we are maximising the impact of our capital budget each, each year in the face of the real terms reduction of 26 per cent that the Chancellor has made to our capital budget over the current spending review period. In 2013-14, we expanded the infrastructure programme by switching from resource budgets to capital budgets. I will write to the Finance Committee setting out the final details of the 2013-14 resource to capital switches. We also remain fully committed to the NPD pipeline of infrastructure projects. The first revenue funded finance project, the Aberdeen Health Village, was opened in 2013-14. £750 million worth of projects are currently in construction and another £1.35 billion of projects are currently in procurement and we expect all major NPD projects to begin construction in the coming financial year. For example, the £46 million acute mental health and North Ayrshire Community Hospital project will start construction on the site of the Ayrshire Central Hospital in Irvine shortly. I announced to Parliament in April that we will continue with this approach with a £1 billion increase in the NPD pipeline, extending it to 2019-20. This will provide the construction sector with the long-term certainty of a future pipeline of work. This expansion takes place within the framework we have established that future revenue payments in support of NPD should not exceed 5% of revenue budgets, ensuring we can deliver now for the economy without over-constraining future budget choices. The Scottish Futures Trust is the Scottish Futures Trust is currently considering a range of infrastructure investments and I will confirm in the draft budget in the autumn the full detail of the planned extension, building on the successes of our current programmes delivering colleges, schools, roads, hospitals and community health facilities across Scotland. However, where we are able to make progress now, I am clear that we should do so. I am pleased to confirm today two significant decisions about this additional investment, first to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary and then in our schools programme. We will allocate £120 million in NPD investment to fund two developments at the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary campus. We will fund a new maternity hospital on the ARI site. NHS Grampian have identified in their maternity services strategy that Aberdeen Maternity Hospital will continue to provide a, special obstetrics, a specialist obstetrics and neonatal service, accommodate a community maternity unit for Aberdeen and the surrounding area, and provide support for maternity services across Grampian. A new hospital will provide high quality new facilities as well as removing £4.2 million worth of backlog maintenance uh, and reducing estates and facilities costs. NHS Grampian's plans are that the new hospital would be designated a women's hospital and would include accommodation for all services as well as the neonatal unit, theatres and gynaecology inpatient and outpatient services. The new maternity hospital will be followed by the development of a cancer centre which is another important element of the development of the campus. The centre will enable the near co-location of uh, our cancer services, which are currently spread across the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary site, and enable delivery of care that is patient-centred, safe and effective in the face of increases in population and forecast demands. The development would complement existing investment pursued through national radiotherapy programme funding. This has provided replacement linear accelerators and bunkers in a new radiotherapy department which has been cited so as to be consistent with the future development of the Cancer Centre. The second major decision that I am also pleased to announce is the immediate release of a further £100 million of NPD investment in school infrastructure through the Government's school building programme, Scotland Schools for the Future. The Government and our local authority partners share an objective of working to improve the quality of the school estate and to ensure that young people are educated in appropriate conditions in the 21st century. We are making progress in this objective Indeed, I saw this at first hand when I opened Invergowrie Primary School in my own constituency earlier this week. 
The Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning and I will work with local authorities over the coming weeks to agree the most effective use of this additional investment of £100 million and agree precise funding allocations. I know that Parliament will welcome these announcements in the quality of our health and education infrastructure. Presiding officer, today's outturn figures and the extension of our NPD programme demonstrate once again the firm grip that this government has on public, Scotland's public finances, our focus on supporting Scotland's economy, our approach to investing in our public services and our determination to deliver on the priorities that we share with the people of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. Many and the Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in the statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes for the questions, after which we'll move on to the next item of business. It would be helpful if members who wish to ask a question were to press the request to speak buttons now. And I now call on Ian Gray to ask the first question, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and thank you to the Cabinet Secretary for his statement and for early sight of it. As always, he makes a polished presentation of his provisional outturn figures, and I would expect no less. Uh, but there is a gap here. Uh, Mr Swinney uh, mentioned towards the end of his statement his determination to deliver on his priorities. But for all of 2013-14, his government had no other priority uh, but the promotion of their independence prospectus. Yet the resource devoted to that is hidden in these high-level figures. So can you tell us exactly how much the Scottish Government spent in 2013-14 on the independence referendum and making the Government's case for separation? That is, the cost of preparing, publishing, producing and promoting their white paper and the consequent documents on pensions, the economy, welfare, etc., to try and cover up that white paper's flaws. The billboards, uh, the mailings which went out to every unsuspecting household in the country, the first ministerial trips to America and Europe to preach the independence gospel, the Cabinet's endless rolling referendum roadshows, and above all, the civil service staff and resources diverted to making the case for separation. So, how much was spent on all of this in 2013-14? Or is this like set-up costs for a new country, one of those inconvenient figures that seems to have escaped the firm grip on finances Mr Swinney was boasting of a moment ago? Mr Swinney. Well, um, that will be a very interesting... That will be a very interesting question... Do we have a little bit of calm of, to hear the answer? That will be a very interesting question for the people of Aberdeen to study yeah. as a consequence yeah. of what Mr Gray has said. Not a single word of welcome no. from Mr Gray exactly. of the government's commitment to invest in healthcare yeah. facilities schools, in the city of Aberdeen, yeah. nor a word of welcome yeah. for the fact that the government has just committed more resources schools, to improve the infrastructure of our schools in Scotland. Yeah. So I think that tells us all we all need we to know, know about the lack of connection of the Labour Party yeah. to the real priorities of the people of Scotland and the issues that, the, uh, that Ian Gray has set out. Now, if Ian Gray, uh, I know he doesn't um, bother himself to participate in the affairs of the parliamentary committees, but if he did, he would show that he would see that uh, I've set out to the Finance Committee in the course of the autumn budget revision and the spring budget revision, the allocations of resources that are made to uh, support the costs of setting out the marketing costs of the white paper, that information has been shared with Parliament, and of course we have committed ourselves to updating that information when all of this activity is completed, and the Government will do exactly that. And as for, and as for the accusation that we sent unsuspected mailings to the householders yeah. of Scotland, yeah, exactly. I got home last night Aye. to the shocking delivery of a booklet from Her Majesty's Government yeah. direct to my house in Perthshire, setting out um, the arguments of the United Kingdom Government. Bad so way. before Ian Gray starts yeah. questioning the Scottish Government about what we are undertaking to legitimately pursue Truly. the policy agenda of this Government, he should ask Downing Street what they're up to into yeah. the bargain. Yeah. Many thanks. Gavin Brown. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement? 
Comparing this year's table to last year's, there would appear to be significant increases in the cash underspends for education, justice, rural affairs and infrastructure. And I just wonder if you can give the Chamber greater details on why those um, underspends came about for those portfolios. Um, secondly, on NPD, uh, we certainly welcome the announcements uh, in relation to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, both projects uh, within that announcement, and we welcome to the schools infrastructure announcement for NPD too. The Cabinet Secretary did say, though, today, and I quote him, NPD is about ensuring we can deliver now for the economy, with an emphasis on the word now. So with that in mind, can he tell us what was the value delivered on the ground via NPD in the last financial year. I ask that because at the halfway stage, only 46 million out of 185 million had been delivered on the ground. So can he tell us, or at least pledge to tell us very soon, what was actually delivered on the ground in 2013-14 via NPD? Cabinet Secretary. Can I thank Mr Brown for his question? I hope he has sight of the note for MSPs that should have accompanied it. He is indicating he has it, which, indicate, which was circulated um, to opposition parties and is available in the Chamber. And in that note, I indicate that the Government will provide further detail on the, vari the significant variances at a portfolio level um, in the, once the consolidated accounts are produced, which will be uh, towards the end of September. Uh, so we certainly will report in fuller detail as part of the consolidated accounts on the variances that are involved. Um, on the second question that he raised about NPD, um, I answered either an oral or a written question from Mr Brown, which indicated that the Scottish Futures Trust were updating the data that is available on the level of activity during 13-14, and that would be available by the time of the draft budget in October. I can say to Mr Reiterate to Mr Brown that in my statement I indicated that there are now £750 million worth of projects that are currently in construction. Um, and uh, which will obviously span over the financial years 13, 14, 14, 15, and some of them may even go into 15, 16 into the bargain, um, which I think gives a, a flavour of the fact that the NPD programme, um, despite the fact that, it, and I've considered this to Parliament on many occasions before, it has taken us longer to uh, mobilise the NPD programme than we would have liked. Um, it is now making a very substantial contribution to construction activity in Scotland uh, today and as a consequence of the statement that I have made today, it will continue uh, that process for uh, a, a period longer, which will give greater clarity to the construction industry about the opportunities that exist uh, to participate in this programme. Many thanks. Kenny Gibson. Presiding officer, I very much welcome this statement, and in particular the investment of £46 million in acute mental services through provision of a North Ayrshire community hospital. Uh, the Scottish Government has prioritised affordable housing by, for example, investing in the social rented sector and abolishing the right to buy, in sharp contrast with Westminster's approach. However, does the Cabinet Secretary share my concerns that the Scottish Government is being penalised for investing more in social housing, whilst HM Treasury reaps the reward of lower housing benefit payments? which should accrue to Scotland as detailed by the work of the Institute of Fiscal Studies. I think well, Mr Gibson uh, uh, clearly explains the, uh, the difficulty that arises out of the fact that the government does not, uh, does not, under the current arrangements, have control of both sides of the balance sheet. So we are unable to reap the rewards and the benefits of some of the other policies that we take forward, which are policies that we take forward for exactly the right reasons about the provision of affordable social housing for citizens within Scotland. So Mr Gibson makes a strong point about the opportunities that would exist to the government if we had uh, wider control of uh, a range of financial levers on both sides of the balance sheet in an independent country. Okay. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary told us that he has budgeted for mitigation of the bedroom tax. We knew that and we welcomed it. But he promised to have a system to use it to make sure no one in Scotland had to pay the bedroom tax by April 1st, irrespective of the DWP's position. It's nearly July now and no such system is in place. He may have the money, but hasn't he betrayed Scottish families who are still paying the tax, who are still paying the tax, three months after he promised to have this system in place and have it sorted. Cabinet Secretary. Well, let's um, 
Let, let's, uh, I've, I've heard this one a number of times from the Labour Party. Um, I thought my, well, well, well let's, 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 just, let's just have a period of quiet for me to explain yes. carefully Aye. to Aye. the Labour front bench who need to hear it loud and clear. Indeed. The total cost of mitigating the cost of the bedroom tax in Scotland are £50 million. Uh, there is, uh, by, under the existing statutory arrangements, it is possible for us to spend about £38 million on mitigating the bedroom tax over the course of the whole financial year, which Ms Mara has conveniently and helpfully explained to me has only run for about three months. So we're one quarter of the way through the financial year and there's £38 million that can yes. legitimately and fully be deployed to deal with the bedroom tax in Scotland. We, so there is a 12, there's £12 million that will be required to be um, uh, applied, which the government has provided for, once we reach the necessary statutory agreements with the United Kingdom government, which I have no reason to say are being in any way uh, held up or anything. I have no complaint about that at all. That's all going uh, in a perfectly agreeable fashion with the UK government. I simply make the very basic, fundamental, arithmetic point to the Labour Party in Scotland that if we have £38 million legally available in Scotland today and we're a quarter through the year and the total liability is 50, if you divide 50 by four, you'll get to a number that's lower than 38. Aye, now, is that simple enough for even the trio that dynamic trio on the front bench of the Labour Party to understand for the second and bluntest time that I can express to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. John Mason. Uh, thank you. I mean, I very much uh, welcome the Cabinet Secretary's announcement of £100 million pounds, uh, for school infrastructure. I think that's incredibly encouraging, uh, especially as schools in Glasgow and beyond have been in a poor state for some time. Can the Cabinet Secretary give us any idea about timescales as to how this would be moved forward? That will be the subject of the discussions the Education Secretary and I will take forward with uh, the, our local authority partners. Uh, the objective that we share with our local authority partners is very clear. Uh, that is to ensure that we make um, as swift progress as we can in ensuring uh, the improvement in the quality of the school estate and the school infrastructure. Uh, our local authority partners are at one with us on that priority and it will be in that spirit that we take forward the uh, discussions to ensure that we deploy that resource in an effective and swift way. Many thanks. Willie Rennie. Yeah, I thank the Finance Secretary for an advanced copy of the statement. Um, just in this very seat here at lunchtime, Alison McInnes asked for more NHS investment in Grampian. I'm sure there must be a connection uh, with the announcement this afternoon. <laughs> Um, but I do welcome the investment in, in Aberdeen and also in the schools, especially considering the short changing that Aberdeen and the North East has received from this government in recent years to introduce a discordant note. Um, but it is important that, considering the contribution that the North East makes to our economy, that they do get a return uh, from this government. I do appreciate his frankness on the delays on the NPD programme in response to Gavin Brown. Can he guarantee that the problems, the significant problems we faced in the early days of the NPD programme have been fully overcome. Sir? I thought for one moment that Mr Rennie was, uh, was on the right lines uh, when he started off his, uh, his argument. I, I, did, I saw Alison McInnes's uh, point, and, and it's, a, you know, it's a point well made, and, and I'm glad the government uh, at the Health Secretary's instigation has uh, been able to take the step that we've taken in relation to the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary site. Um, uh, on Mr Rennie's wider point about uh, the infrastructure of the North East of Scotland, uh, obviously the uh, development of the new um, Her Majesty's Prison Grampian has been a significant investment in, uh, in, in, in recent uh, months and years, uh, and we obviously are now at a very advanced stage in being able to deploy the expenditure on the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route, which is a project that I know um, his party supported in, in their term in government and that is now at a very advanced stage of procurement and we expect construction to start on that um, in quarter four 2014 um, which will be a very welcome contribution to improving the infrastructure of the north east of Scotland. In relation to the 
Uh, the general point he made about NPD, I, I, I don't think I could have been more open with Parliament about the fact that we estimated it would take a shorter time to get NPD projects up and running. Um, I think what's clear from the data that I shared in response to Mr Brown's question that that is now a, a programme that has real momentum, that the procurement activity is now being undertaken very swiftly. Um, indeed, um, one of the most recent projects that have got to financial close has got to financial close in a much shorter period than we would ordinarily have imagined. Uh, so I think we have some uh, significant progress uh, on the MPD programme uh, and that will continue in the period ahead. Many thanks. Short questions and answers will allow us to endeavour to get everyone in. I can now call on Mr Macmillan, Stuart Macmillan. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, I too welcome the statement, Cabinet Secretary. But uh, the Cabinet Secretary has had to deal with the declining settlements from Westminster and once again has done so within budget. But does the Cabinet Secretary agree that changing from an austerity approach to using the powers of independence to invest in the economy could actually increase revenues for Scotland and support further investment in public services? It, clearly, presiding officer, that the ability to take decisions that um, create stronger and more effective economic infrastructure in Scotland will help the long-term progress of the Scottish economy, and having a wider range of powers available to do so will enable us to, to fulfil that objective. Thank you. Ken McIntosh. Thank you, presiding officer. The cabinet secretary will be aware that there are 150,000 fewer students uh, studying at Scottish colleges as a direct result of the decisions he has taken since 2007 as Cabinet Secretary for Finance. In recent years, he has tried to use some of the uh, consequentials or outturn monies to revisit or try to unpick or mitigate some of the damage he has wrought on Scotland's colleges, uh, but budgets continue to fall. I note today that education is one of the biggest contributors to his underspend. Can I ask him why has he not offered anything in today's announcement for Scotland's colleges? Yep, I think. I think First of all, on Mr McIntosh's point, the, the Government committed itself to maintaining the number of full-time equivalent places in Scotland's colleges, and that is exactly what we've done. And what we've, uh, what we've focused the college sector on, and I think this is independently verified by the Wood Commission in their analysis, where they highlighted a strengthened college sector in Scotland as a consequence of the government reforms, we have focused the college sector more and more on supporting the journey that individuals make into employment. And I think that's the right approach to take so that individuals can acquire the more detailed skills that will enable them to participate in the labour market and to fulfil their own potential. So the, when we have independent uh, exercises like the Wood Review, highlighting the strengthening of the college sector that has taken place as a consequence of the government's reform programme, I think members such as Mr McIntosh should take reassurance that the reform programme has been effective and that we now need to sustain, as the government is committed to doing, sustain our investment to ensure that we reap the rewards of that investment programme and that reform programme that we have undertaken. Thank you. Jamie Hepburn. Thanks, President Officer. Is the Cabinet Secretary aware that uh, this week uh, research uh, by Sheffield Hallam University was published which indicated that as a consequence of the Scottish Government's uh, investments in welfare reform mitigation, the impact of UK Government's welfare uh, reforms is some £35 less per working age adult uh, here in Scotland? And can you also tell us what assessment uh, the Scottish Government has made of the impact of its uh, £260 million investment in welfare reform mitigation? Um, clearly, the, uh, the, the, the investment the government has made has been designed to support individuals in financial vulnerability. It will assist individuals in contributing to the, uh, to, to the Scottish economy by sustaining their, uh, their own livelihoods and their own circumstances. Um, the government continues to review the challenge of welfare reform and the effect that welfare reform has on the population in Scotland, and will continue to do that uh, during the spending review period. Many thanks. Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, a week or two ago, the Cabinet Secretary allocated an additional £31 million for the capital implications of expanding uh, early education and childcare for two-year-olds, but I think the Scottish Government has estimated that it costs, uh, will cost £61 million. In fact, COSLA believes it will be significantly more. So has any of the underspend money been allocated for that purpose? Absolutely. The, the, the Government has committed itself to uh, £61 million pounds worth of expenditure to support the early years commitments. That is an increase of what we originally set out would be our estimate. 
and that has arisen out of further uh, design work that we have undertaken with our local authority partners. Our discussions with COSLA continue in that respect and, of course, the, um, the, 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 the supporting that £61 million is provided for in the Government's capital programme. It may not all fall within the 2014-15 financial year, uh, but that will be a subject that I will continue to discuss with our local authority partners. Thank you. Briefly and finally, Christian Allard. Unlike the Labour frontbench, who never cared for the needs of the people of the North East when Labour was in power, I welcome this investment announced by the Cabinet Secretary for health facilities in Aberdeen, which will be of great benefit to all my constituents across the North East. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what timescales are in place for delivery of this project? Can I say? Uh, the uh, what I can say to Mr Allard is that uh, this project forms part of the capital programme of, Gran of NHS Grampian. Uh, the Government will work with NHS Grampian to put in place the, um, the steps that are necessary to apply this project. Uh, the typical lead-in time to a project um, reaching financial close um, can be of the order of about two years. Um, we try to accelerate that timescale if, if it is at all possible. And I can assure uh, Mr Allard um, that the Health Secretary will be taking steps to ensure that this project is delivered as swiftly as it possibly can do. And I welcome very much the comments of Mr Allard in representing the North East of Scotland for this important investment that has been made in the Aberdeen Royal Infirmary campus. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That ends that particular statement. The next item of business is a statement by Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil on an update on polypropylene mesh devices. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. It would be helpful for members who are wish to ask a question to the Cabinet Secretary if they were to press the request to speak button now. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Cabinet Secretary, you've got around 20 minutes or so. No, 10 minutes. Right. 20 minutes for questions. <laughs> Thank you, that Presiding Officer. I thought you were being unduly generous there. Uh, Presiding Officer, thank you for the opportunity to make a statement regarding mesh implant procedures. Uh, I was deeply troubled when I first met with some of the women adversely affected by these implants and heard of the horrendous complications that they have suffered, in some cases altering their lives forever. They have shown considerable courage raising the profile of this issue, discussing publicly these very personal, sensitive issues, especially when we consider that they will not now personally benefit from any changes. Mesh implants for pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence are classified as medical devices and governed by EU regulations. As soon as I became aware of the anguish experienced by these women, I asked the Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Dr Francis Elliott, to investigate and recommend action to address these issues. We estimate that around 1,500 women suffering from stress urinary incontinence and 350 suffering from pelvic organ prolapse have synthetic mesh implant surgery each year in Scotland. These conditions result in a reduced quality of life and I understand that traditional surgery techniques have a high failure rate 20 to 30 per cent for primary pelvic organ prolapse surgery, surgery, for example. The 2012 York Report, a study commissioned by the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency, estimates that around 1 to 3 per cent of women experience complications following stress urinary incontinence surgery, and for pelvic organ prolapse surgery, the percentage experiencing complications, according to the MHRE, is slightly higher, around 2 to 6 per cent. This contrasts with a failure rate of 20 to 30 per cent for traditional surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. This research indicated that a majority of women, around 1,450 annually in Scotland, appear to benefit from mesh tape surgery for stress urinary incontinence without complications. There is, however, growing public concern about the number of women experiencing complications linked with underreporting of adverse events and a poor understanding as to why these complications have occurred. I do not believe we know the real incidence of adverse events in relation to these procedures, and we are not yet able to trace implants to individuals. The Scottish Government therefore considers the following action as being necessary to address the issue. 
As I outlined to the public petition committee meeting last week, I've asked the acting chief medical officer to request all NHS boards in Scotland to consider suspending routine mesh implant procedures for pelvic organ prolapse and stress urinary incontinence. And I can confirm that the acting CMAO has now written to all health boards. NHS Inform has pr provided an information page on their website and crucially all boards are currently contacting patients listed for surgery and where necessary putting in place alternative pathways for these women. Members will know that the Scottish Government does not have the authority to withdraw these products as this is a reserve matter. However, I am aware that two health boards have stopped mesh implant procedures for treatment of pelvic organ prolapse prior to my announcement last week, due to changes in staff and the small numbers of procedures being carried out. These changes will support the development of any new specialised pathways. The decision to request that boards suspend the routine use of synthetic mesh for these procedures does not prevent individual women and their clinicians agreeing on the need for a particular service, and which will still be available. In addition, I have endorsed the position that for the improvement of our future evidence, if women are being considered for entry into clinical trials, then use of mesh for the conditions affected can be approved for those entered into the arms of the trial using this option, provided the risks associated with this procedure are fully explained. I've also asked for an independent review to be set up urgently to report on the issues raised, such as complication rates and under-reporting, which will become a growing concern. This review will establish the facts and report at the beginning of 2015, taking account of the European Commission study on these devices due in January. The review will look at synthetic implant procedures for both stress, urinary incontinence and for pelvic organ prolapse. I fully understand that these are two very different procedures and the review will take account of this. I can announce today that Dr. Leslie Wilkie, a retired Director of Public Health, will lead the independent review. The review will start next month and report, as I said, early in 2015. The key priority for this review is to establish the facts concerning the number of women experiencing complications and the issue of underreporting for adverse events. And I will ask Dr. Wilkie to consult with the women's group and indeed with clinicians in the NHS board prior to finalising the specific detailed remit for her review. I gave an undertaking that the women would be consulted and I intend to keep to that undertaking. In addition, the Deputy CMO is chairing a working group that includes clinicians and patient representatives to consider the issues in more detail. The group has now met twice, and I would like to thank the patient representatives and the clinicians for their ongoing contribution. The group has produced a new patient information and consent booklet for stress urinary incontinence, and this was published yesterday on the Scottish Government website. This booklet clearly demonstrates the risks associated with this procedure and the alternatives av available before women make a decision on whether they wish to proceed. The information in this booklet will be the absolute minimum information provided to patients in future by NHS boards. There are also two patient guidance booklets being developed that set out the pathway for the management of pelvic organ prolapse and for women who present with complications. The Deputy CMO will be working with NHS colleagues and the women to develop this service as a matter of urgency. I can confirm that in the last year, the CMO has written three times to all GPs through medical directors, alerting them to the possibility that women may suffer complications following insertion of these mesh implants and that all adverse events should be reported to the MHRA. I recently received correspondence from the Scottish Pelvic Floor Network proposing that MHRA reporting of complications should be made mandatory, and I've responded to say that I agree with this proposal. As you have already heard, mesh implants are classified as medical devices and are governed through the EU Medical Device Directive. MHRA is a competent authority in the UK and it has responsibility for the removal of any device from the market for the whole of the UK. Evidence is required in order for it to take such a step 
which is why the research we are supporting is so important. Individual medical devices follow procedures set out in the EU directives by manufacturers to gain a CA mark, a conformity marking, awarded by notified bodies. MHRA oversees the work of these organisations performing regular audits. The rules for classifying medical devices are applicable across all EU member states. I have previously spoken to the MHRA Chief Executive medical and Medical Director and yesterday met with the Chairman Sir Gordon Duff and the Medical Director and was reassured in discussions that they are taking this issue very seriously and have confirmed that they will also be happy to participate in the Scottish Review in addition to the additional work they are undertaking. I have also written to the European Commission which is currently working towards formulating a scientific opinion on the safety of these devices, and that, as I said, this work will be available in January. The chairman of the scientific committee has assured me that they are taking this issue very seriously, and I have requested if there is further action that they can take, uh, I have requested if there is further action that they can take until this research is available, they should take it. We are aware of the US Food and Drug Administration's proposal to reclassify mesh for pelvic organ prolapse from a moderate risk device to a high risk device. Currently, of course, Europe has a 2B classification, which is moderate to high risk. The Scottish Government will participate in the UK working group also. Their remit includes determining the means of ensuring the clinical quality of procedures involving tapes and meshes for the treatment of stress, urinary incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse. This group will meet for the first time next month. Presiding officer, to conclude, I want to reassure members that we are taking every possible action to address these issues in respect of mesh implants and to improve the situation and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Neil Findlay. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for early state of his statement and welcome his belated action, the belated action he has taken to suspend the use of polypropylene mesh. But this statement and his year of dithering throws up many more questions than it answers. Almost a year ago, in rejecting the call for the suspension of mesh, the Cabinet Secretary claimed that A, he had no power to act and B, that he could not act because he feared litigation by the manufacturers. He also claimed at that time that the number of women who had experienced problem, problems with mesh was very low. So, President Officer, how many women have had complications following mesh surgery for stress, urinary incontinence or pelvic prolapse, and how many have had to have it removed? What advice have these women been given since his announcement? And given the limited number of con consultants available in Scotland to deal with mesh complications and that some patients are waiting five months for a review appointment, will the Cabinet Secretary agree to fund health boards to allow patients to be seen elsewhere in the UK? Because it's my understanding that at present some health boards have advised mesh victims that they will not fund out-of-area consultations. <coughs> and why is it that a year ago did the Cabinet Secretary claim that he had no powers to act when clearly he did? Who gave him that advice? And will he publish it? And when did the Cabinet Secretary become aware of the fact that NHS Dumfries and Galloway had acted last year to suspend MESH despite his protestations that he did not have the powers to act? How many more women have been treated with MESH during his year of dithering? And why did the Cabinet Secretary fear litigation by the manufacturers a year ago, but apparently does not fear it now? Finally, President Officer, I want to pay tribute to each and every one of the MESH victims. They were doubted by some in the medical profession and let down by the Cabinet Secretary. They deserved better and they deserve answers now. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, it's a great pity the opposition spokesman for the Labour Party can never rise to the occasion. I would have hoped that we would get a united chamber on this matter. Uh, just, just for the facts, because I know sometimes the facts confuse the argument with Mr Finlay. Uh, in terms of the latest year available, full year, 2011-12, there were 313 POP mesh procedures and 1,436 SUI tape procedures. That was the same year there was the York report showing that estimated uh, complication rates for POP procedures were between 2 and 6%. And for SUI tape procedures between 1 and 3 per cent. Now, that was the evidence available to me uh, last year. 
I should also point out that obviously it is a very serious matter to suspend any procedure, particularly when a total of 17 to 1,800 people are going through these procedures and uh, the official figures show that 95% of them have a successful procedure. What has convinced me is after discussion with the MHRA, it became very clear to me that the scale of under-reporting of adverse events was far higher, was far, no, I would get it from the scientists, Mr Finlay, not from you. Mr Finlay, uh, stop. The Mr Finlay, Mr Finlay. The rate Finlay. of adverse events was far higher than uh, anyone has officially estimated. And if I can just give some figures to show uh, some of my concerns. If you take the SUI tape procedure alone, the estimated annual number of complications in Scotland based on the York report is up to 45 women. But the total number reported to the MHRA by healthcare professions has, for that year was four, but the total number reported to MHRA by the public was 110. Now, clearly, there's a problem in there, and it's that kind of statistic, that kind of evidence, because you, if you're in this job, you have to base decisions on evidence. And that kind of evidence is what led me to take the decision to request health boards, because I do not have the power to tell health, health boards willy-nilly to suspend any operation, nor do I have the power over the product itself. As I explained in detail in my statement, that power resides with the MHRA. It is a reserve matter, and they work within the overall EU directive. Jackson Carlo. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of his statement? May I also pay tribute to my constituent Elaine Holmes, who, together with others, I helped support in the presentation of her petition to the Petitions Committee. Her evidence was highly emotional, compelling and brave. And if I may say so, I believe the Cabinet Secretary's response uh, is equally brave too. There are a number of questions I'd like to put. Um, has he had conversations with the Department of Health since his announcement? Have any health departments from other countries been in touch with them? Uh, there will be a tremendous number of women who believe they've had a successful implant who may now be reading that there can be late complications that arise. And I wonder what uh, reassurance or guidance he is making available to women who perhaps have had a mesh implant who may now have a concern that they didn't have a week ago before this announcement was made. And, and finally, I wonder, given that there are a number of health issues that arise from implants in, uh, of general, in general terms, I wonder if the Scottish Government might consider being at the forefront of leading a campaign to ensure that all implants are barcoded in future, in order that when issues like this do arise, we are able to establish, perhaps some years after the event, who has had an implant and who may therefore need to be consulted or reassured as a consequence of that. Cabinet Secretary. Great. These are very intelligent questions and very, as usual, fairly put. Can I just deal with the, the latter point in terms of barcoding? With some of the products, there's already barcoding, but there's no database of the mesh that has been used in a particular woman at a particular time in a particular hospital. And therefore, one of the exercises we are engaged in with the MHRA and have been since the issue was brought to our attention by the women is the creation of a database uh, for future use so that we will always know what, not only how many, but what meshes were used in what procedures in what women in what hospital so that if, if and when anything does go wrong, uh, then it can be traced back to find out the source and the type of product that was used. Uh, unfortunately, that has not been the case to date. And because of that, that is one of the reasons why the degree of information and intelligence available to us is so sporadic and uh, quite frankly, in terms of measuring adverse advents, is actually unreliable now, in my view. In terms of guidance to women who have already had implants, the Chief Medical Officer is actually uh, it's instructed that guidance be issued to all women. First of all, in terms of our pri immediate priorities, those women who were due to have a procedure uh, in the immediate future, and all of them are being contacted as we speak to invite them in for a consultation with the relevant consultant so that he or she can map out the pathways that they can follow uh, if they, uh, I mean, obviously need help during the period ahead. 
But secondly, we will be issuing advice to people who've already had implants about how they can find out if they are likely to have any problems in the future. I know myself, I've had one case in my own constituency where the mesh implant only caused a problem 12 years after it had actually been implanted. And that's another reason why I think we need much more in-depth study, because there's been no longitudinal study of the impact of mesh implants or any longitudinal analysis of the incidence of adverse events. And without a longitudinal analysis, it's obviously much more difficult to reach an evidence-based scientific objective conclusion as to what is going wrong and why, in many cases, things are going wrong. In terms of the conversations with the Department of Health, our, our main conversations have been with the MHRA, but through the MHRA, all the Departments of Health in the UK are involved in this issue, and they're all represented in the MHRA Working Party. And of course, because it's very much guided by EU directives, uh, through the MHRA, we're in touch with all the health departments in Europe. Uh, and of course, uh, the MHRA itself is now working closely with the Federal Drugs and Food Administration in the United States. This is very much a global problem. I actually had an email last week from a lady in New Zealand who's had similar problems to the ones that the ladies who presented to the petitions committee outlined. So I think this is something, it's a worldwide phenomenon. And actually, as the MHRA pointed out to me, Scotland is actually the most advanced in trying to get to the bottom of why these adverse events uh, are taking place. Thank you. Ilan McLeod, followed by Rhoda Grant. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I uh, start by welcoming all the actions the Cabinet Secretary has taken to address the very serious concerns raised around mesh implants. Now, I'll the comments from Professor Don Boyrick, who has said previously that thanks to the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, Scotland is the safest nation on earth from the viewpoint of healthcare. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how that collaborative approach that's been taken in the Patient Safety Programme is informing the Government's approach to this particular issue? <laughs> well, the main motivation in asking the health boards to suspend, of course, was in relation to patient safety, because it's not just the number of adverse events, it's actually the horrific impact on these women when things go wrong. I mean, it really does ruin lives. And therefore, that's why I think it's very important that we regard patient safety and quality as absolutely top of the healthcare agenda. And it's why Scotland does have the safest health service in the world, according to Professor Don Berwick, who, of course, is an advisor to Prime Minister Cameron, as well as President Obama. Uh, and this fits very well in terms of the overall governing philosophy of the patient safety programme, and that is that patient safety has to be absolutely a number one priority along with the quality of care that we provide. And that's why, for example, a Canadian study recently put the Scottish and indeed the UK health services uh, as the top health services in the world. Thank you. Can I just give notification to members? I am going to struggle to call everybody who wishes to speak or to ask the uh, Cabinet Secretary a question, but I will do my best and we'll press on. Rhoda Grant, followed by John Wilson. Thank you, Thank you Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to clarify a statement which seems to be contrary to that of NHS Dumfries and Galloway, which states, following concerns that have been raised nation nationally and internationally, we have taken the local decision to suspend the use of mesh, and this has been in place since last year. Can I also ask, with regard to the review, what is the remit in terms of reference? How will he ensure no conflict of interest in the review? And how will he also ensure that the concerns and experience of the women affected will be at the very heart of the review? And what all alternative treatments will be available to women suffering those conditions? Captain. Uh, well, first of all, in relation to Dumfries and Galloway, in the evidence, uh, I think, to the Petitions Committee, the Medical Director in Dumfries and Galloway, and certainly it was reported in the press that Dumfries and Galloway had suspended these, these uh, procedures. In actual fact, uh, uh, Dumfries and Galloway stopped the procedures. They didn't suspend them because of no intention of reinstituting them, because one of the things we are looking at is creating centres of excellence for these procedures because one of the problems in Dumfries and Galloway was the, the, throughput, the throughput of patients 
was inadequate to keeping up the quality required and therefore they decided to stop those procedures and in fact the expert that they had employed also no longer works in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, but uh, Dumfries and Galloway obviously in the way in which it was reported in the press uh, suggested that they had suspended with and suspension suggests that they may be reintroducing them. That is not currently their intention. In terms of potential conflict of interest, as I spelt out to the petitions committee last week, uh, that I would be making sure that whoever was appointed to lead this review would have no potential conflict of interest, and in particular, no previous or current contractual relationship with the manufacturers. I can confirm that Dr Wilkie fits the bill. She has no such and has had no such contractual relationship. In terms of the review itself, as I said in my statement, I am asking Dr Wilkie, as her first step, is to sit down with the women and agree the remit for the review in detail because I want to be absolutely sure that we satisfy these women. I think we owe it to these women to make sure that the review is comprehensive enough to cover all aspects of their concerns. Obviously, she will consult with the, the clinicians and with NHS boards as well, and I will confirm the detailed remit to the Chamber at the appropriate time. Uh, in terms of the advice being given to women, uh, there is a clear direction from the Chief Medical Officer about the need to offer women the, a, path, a clear pathway in terms of their treatment, as I said earlier, particularly those women who were due to have a procedure in the immediate future. Uh, there are a number of ways in which they can be supported. For example, weight loss is one of them, and that will happen, and we will make sure that all the women who are on the waiting list are contacted and offered a special session to advise on the way forward and a pathway worked out in co-production between the clinician and the women. John Wilson, followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, President Officer, to welcome the statement today and the announcement made by the Cabinet Secretary last week at the Public Petitions Committee. And I also welcome the announcement about the booklet outlining the associated risks of this procedure. Could I ask the Cabinet Secretary whether the booklet contains information on the possibility that following the procedure that women may not be able to have children? And could he also indicate how patients can feed back concerns about the lack of information being provided to allow them to make informed choices prior to the operation? Cabinet Secretary. Can I just say, I've got the, uh, the uh, booklet here, and this is the synthetic, synthetic vaginal mesh mid urethral tape procedure for the surgical treatment of stress, urinary incontinence in women. And for the sake of... Uh, making sure I cover this properly. It covers an explanation of terms, what, a, de a definition of what is stress, urinary incontinence, alternative options of treatments, what is synthetic vaginal mesh tape procedure, possible risks of this procedure, useful resources, questions that she, women should ask their surgeon, and what their expectation should be from surgery, as well as the consent form. So it's a detailed 18-page uh, booklet, and I'm happy to make sure that one's placed in spice so that everybody can see exactly all the issues that are covered. Uh, thank you, Jim Hume, followed by John Scott. Thank you. Uh, will the Cabinet Secretary advise campaigners in the Chamber today what support will now be offered to MESH patients who have already un undergone a traumatic experience and are now left with health complications? And will he also advise what discussions he will have with the EU Commission on the issue of the regulatory regime when manufacturers are the ones apparently policing de devices when adverse incidents are reported? And note that the MHRA, uh, by their own admission, uh, have no independent test facility. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, first of all, in terms of discussions with the manufacturers, clearly the whole purpose of what the work that's going on in Europe, in the UK and now in Scotland, is to uh, define exactly what we need to do to guarantee future safety in terms of any of these procedures and the use of particular products. So there will be very strong interface with manufacturers, obviously, uh, as part of the work that's being done, uh, because clearly we want to be absolutely sure 
we identify whether in most cases or in any cases the actual products and there are a variation of products whether the products have been the problem or whether the procedure has been the problem or whether it's the procedure and the products that are the problem. And that's clearly one of the areas we need to focus in on in trying to get to the bottom of why these implants have gone wrong in so many cases. In terms of those women who've already had a, an adverse event and a bad experience and have been, whose health has been damaged as a result of these procedures, as I said right from the beginning, that we will ensure that any medical assistance, including any further procedures that these women require and they agree with their clinician, obviously will be provided in the National Health Service and we'll make sure that it is. Thank you. Can I just indicate to members that I do intend to allow this statement to run on uh, for a bit more time because a number of uh, members are still wishing to ask questions. It is important, it is sensitive, and I intend to do that. The consequences of that will be that decision time is likely to not play, take place until quarter to five tonight, but we will sort the procedural uh, bits out later on. Um, John Scott, followed by Jim Eady. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I too thank the Cabinet Secretary for the advance copy of his statement? And Sadly, we are where we are, but can I now ask the Cabinet Secretary what the pathways of care, apart from weight loss, will be for adversely affected women? And will a specialist centre perhaps be set up, perhaps in Glasgow, perhaps one already exists de facto, to deal with and perhaps develop removal techniques uh, to deal with and perhaps develop removal techniques to address these problems? And if so, has a budget allocation been made towards this or will one be made? Cabinet Secretary. Can I deal with the latter point first? That's clearly one of the areas we're already working on uh, because very clearly at the moment, uh, prior to the request for suspension, most health boards provided one or other or both of these procedures. And again, I should stress they are two different procedures. And while I think there's a commonality in terms of the problem we've had, nevertheless, we do need to address both procedures uh, as separate issues that need to be addressed. Uh, and there is undoubtedly some division in the clinical community uh, we, in relation to the safety of the tapes vis-a-vis -vis the safety of the meshes. Clinicians don't entirely all agree with each other uh, about those issues. But we are looking at the future delivery of all services related to these procedures, including dealing with, in the future, the complications and the consequences of complications. And I think it's very clear that we need areas of expertise uh, rather than necessarily having these so widely available across the country, where in some cases, as in Dumfriesa Galloway, the throughput of women was such that it didn't really meet the new standards on patient safety more generally. Uh, because clearly for some procedures, it's very important for the high throughput in order for the clinicians to maintain their high standards and indeed to upgrade their skills continually with the changes in technology. So that work's already underway and I anticipate that being concluded round about the turn of the year. And it's at that time we will allocate budgets in terms of which health boards are hosting uh, any centres of excellence in relation to these procedures. In terms of the pathways, uh, the, the Chief Medical Officer uh, is, as I said, issuing details on the various pathways that can be offered to women, one of which is weight loss, uh, one of which is, I mean, theoretically a traditional operation, but the failure rate in that is such we would certainly not uh, recommend that at all, and I think the boards would not. One would be, actually, if they can, wait until the results of these uh, reports, if they are able to do that and can suffer you know, the problems they have long enough, that's a potential uh, option for women to see what is safe and what isn't safe, and then they're in a better position to make their own judgment about what procedure they want to follow. Jamie Duke, followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that while all surgical procedures in the NHS must be based on the latest clinical evidence, backed by robust data and open and transparent record-keeping, 
the most important factors must always be pa the patient experience and patient safety. Will he commit today to ensure that the voice of patients and the Scottish Mesh Survivors Group and the he Hear Our Voice campaign continues to be heard during the independent review process and at all levels of decision making? Cabinet yeah, absolutely. I, I think I stress that it's very, very important uh, that the patients are involved in this. And in fact, the working group that's already working under the leadership of Dr. Francis Elliott already contains two representatives from the women's group. And I think that's extremely important at every level uh, because clearly nobody knows better the consequences, particularly of the adverse events, than the women themselves. Richard Lyle, followed by Hugh Henry. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, thank you, President Officer. As a member of the Health Committee, I wish to uh, welcome today's statement and I compliment the Cabinet Secretary on his uh, action. The Cabinet Secretary has said that alternative care pathways would be developed for women who have suffered complications and women who decide to go ahead with a mess procedure. Can the Cabinet Secretary offer any guidance on how quickly this could be in place? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've already the Chief Medical Officer has already been in touch with all the health boards to make sure uh, that the, uh, the clinicians get in touch with the women affected and to arrange and offer early appointments with them. And then each woman, obviously, will go through with her clinician what's the most appropriate pathway for her. And I think it's extremely important, A, that we do that for every woman uh, potentially affected by this, and that's everybody on the waiting list, obviously. Uh, secondly, that we do it quickly. And thirdly, that we do it in terms of the advice that's on offer. There's already fairly extensive advice on a whole range of issues relating to this from NICE and from other sources. And all of that uh, is already in the hands of the health boards and the clinicians, but the chief medical officer will be keeping a very close monitoring eye on this whole area of guidance on different pathways available to the women. Hugh Henry, and does Chick Brody want a question? You do. Hugh Henry, followed by Chick Brody. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he will now consider requests for a funded support service for those affected? And will he ensure that patient involvement in any such group, which he previously acknowledged is vital? These women deserve our support. Cabinet Secretary. Presiding officer, I would anticipate that being one of the bits of work that would be addressed by the review, but also by the work that's already going on in terms of what support is required in addition to the medical support. Uh, the medical support is obviously the immediate priority, and I've made it absolutely clear that whatever medical support these women need, they will get. Uh, any additional support needs need to be identified systematically, and then we look at uh, what then has to be provided where it has to be provided, how much it's going to cost and how it would be funded. Finally, Chuck Brody. Thank you, President Officer, and thank you for extending the time to allow me to ask my question. Mesh implants have created great personal misery for some, misery for one being one too many. So I ask the Cabinet Secretary, what assurances can he give that MHRA and the relevant European authorities which issue product uh, directives will be asked to review their practices, practices processes and legal responsibilities to avoid similar events in future and to do that review quickly and also what positive involved and direct role does he see for Scotland in the future in this process? Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, as I said in my statement, I've already written to the European Commission uh, and as, although the MHRA is a statutory body for the UK very clearly, we want to have direct dialogue ourselves with the European Commission to make sure and to satisfy ourselves that everything has been done and done objectively in terms to address all of these issues. Uh, in terms of the, the points raised by Mr Brodie, clearly that's the subject of the discussions we're having with the MHRA and that we would want to have with the European Commission, uh, in, particularly in terms of their current review, which is due to report in January 2015. Thank you. That ends the statement from the Cabinet Secretary. Point of order, Mr Grant. In, in his answer to my question, the Cabinet Secretary suggested that I was quoting from press reports, whereas actually I was quoting from a letter from NHS Dumfries and Galloway to the Petitions Committee, which is available on the Parliament website. Can you advise how the, the, the Cabinet Secretary can amend his statement to give the accurate position of NHS Dumfries and Galloway? Cabinet Secretary.
Thank you. Um, that ends the statement from the Cabinet Secretary. Um, given that I have uh, allowed that statement to run on a bit, I am minded to accept a motion without notice under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the time for the debate. Decision time will therefore be at 4.45. Somebody would move a motion without notice. Good Ms no, Dugdale, I am obliged to you. Thank you. I now put the question to the Chamber that decision time be at 4.45. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Um, I now invite the convener um, of the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Park Bull uh, to lead the debate. Uh, Ms McMahon, you've got 11 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. As convener of the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Park Bill Committee, I am pleased to open this final stage debate. I would like to thank all those who have assisted the Committee in its scrutiny of the Bill, including objectors to and the promoter of the Bill. The contributions from both sides on this issue have assisted the Committee in reaching decisions on what has been a complex and highly controversial Bill. I would also like to thank my colleagues on the Committee, James Dornan, Fiona McLeod and Alison McInnes, for their diligence and hard work in scrutinising the Bill and for their support throughout this entire process. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. I would also like to thank those Parliament staff who have assisted the Committee in our deliberations, in particular Mary, Stephen, Linda and David, for their guidance and dedication throughout this entire process. Not only were they with us every step of the way, but I know they have given up their personal time to assist us in this lengthy process, and for that I and the other members of the Committee are truly grateful. Finally, I would like to thank Richard in my own office, who has had the unenviable task of putting up with me throughout the process. Today represents the culmination of over a year of hard work since the Bill was introduced on 25 April 2013. In total, the Committee has undertaken around 15 hours of scrutiny and evidence-taking at consideration stage alone, which resulted in the publication of our consideration stage report on the 22nd of May. By way of background, for anyone who may not be familiar, the purpose of the Bill is to remove a legal obstacle which prevents the City of Edinburgh Council changing the use of Portobello Park so that it might become the site of the new Portobello High School. In effect, the Bill would change the legal status of Portobello Park from inalienable to alienable common good land for the purpose of Part 6 of the Local Government Scotland Act 1973 to allow the Council to appropriate it to its education function and build the school on the park. The Bill does not in itself authorise the building of the school that being subject to the local authority planning process. At preliminary stage, the promoter provided detail of the alternative legal approaches which had been considered to achieve the promoter's objective, none of which were as attractive to the promoter as pursuing a private bill. In this context, the committee at preliminary stage was aware of the apparent legal anomaly whereby councils can dispose of local authority land to third parties with the consent of the courts but are unable to appropriate common good land for the other, other uses and considered whether one way of addressing that might be a change to the general law which applies throughout Scotland. We therefore wrote to the Minister for Local Government and Planning at that stage and were advised on the 21st of November 2013 that the Scottish Government had not reached any decision on that subject. The Minister acknowledged the importance of the issue and referred to the consultation on the draft Community Empowerment Bill, which would include provisions on greater transparency in the management and disposal of the common good. The Committee concluded at that time that it appeared that, even if the Scottish Government did decide to legislate in this area, any such legislation was not imminent. I am aware that the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill was subsequently introduced on the 11th of June, and the provisions of the Bill place a statutory duty on local authorities to establish and maintain a publicly available register for all property held by them for the common good, and must notify and receive any representations from community bodies or other persons in respect of the list of property they intend to include on the register. They are also under a duty to publish their proposals and consult community bodies before disposing of or changing the use of common good property. It is clear, therefore, that the proposals included in the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill would not address the wider specific legal anomaly addressed in this Bill, and the Committee's decision at the preliminary stage that the private bill procedure was suitable for this Bill remains appropriate. Turning now to our deliberations at consideration stage, the Committee's task was to consider all remaining objections, Phase 1, and to lodge any amendments it felt were necessary as an outcome of these deliberations, Phase 2. The Committee was very aware that its role included acting and complying with the Parliament's obligations in terms of human rights. 
The procedures followed by the committee therefore ensured that the parties involved had a fair opportunity to pre present their respective cases. This was achieved through the extensive evidence we had before us, the objections themselves, supplementary written submissions and the oral evidence sessions which ran from the 12th of March to the 7th of May 2014. Once we had considered all of this evidence, our task was to assess each objection and consider whether the private interests of those adversely affected by the Bill outweigh the wider public interest in what the Bill seeks to deliver. I am sorry, I do not have time um, to take interventions. The Committee had, been, had before it 59 objections to the Bill. Consideration of these objections was not an easy task. We considered a diverse range of subject matters during the course of this phase, from the promoter's pre-introductory consultation process the possibility of the Bill setting a precedent for other local authorities to use as a mechanism to bypass the protection of common good land, which it was argued would occur if the Bill proceeds, to issues which are also subject to the planning process. In determining the approach to assessing objections, the Committee was also keenly conscious, as it had been from the start of the scrutiny process, that its role was not to carry out a planning inquiry. Planning matters had already been addressed during two planning application processes. The Committee's consideration of objections under the standing orders was in the context of determining the extent to which an adverse effect of a Bill, which might also be a planning matter, would impact on an individual's private interests and the extent to which this would be balanced by the overall benefit to the community by the Bill. In relation to the practicalities of our approach to consideration of objections, these were provisionally divided into a number of groups on a geographical basis. For example, objectors who live adjacent to the park were identified as one group, and those who lived in the surrounding area to the north of the park as another. We put the main group opposed to the school being built in the park, Portobello Park Action Group, and known associated objectors in a group of its own, as well as golfers who we considered to be a special interest group. We consulted all objectors in each of the six groups regarding the selection of lead objectors who, when agreed, were invited to coordinate oral evidence on behalf of their respective groups. All 59 objectors were also given the opportunity to provide supplementary written evidence in support of their original objection. In the event, only six objectors took up that invitation. All groups of objectors were represented at oral evidence sessions to the committee. The promoter also attended these sessions. This was intended to allow each party the opportunity to pre present their case on specific issues and to cross-examine the other side. Before commenting on our own views on other issues related in objections, I would like to refer briefly to matters which the Committee had already considered at preliminary stage. These included the Parliament legislating after a Court of Session decision, the possibility of this Bill setting a precedent and alternative sites for the school. We set out our views on these issues at the pre preliminary stage, and the Committee was not convinced there was any substantive reason to change those views as a result of the further evidence produced at consideration stage. At preliminary stage, the committee had encouraged the promoter to reflect on the lessons learned from each aspect of the process in relation to the consultation. We were reassured to learn that the promoter intended to take into account a number of actions for future consultation exercises, such as ensuring that, for any public meetings which involve non-council representatives, all participants should be able to comment on the proposed format of the meeting. While we did not consider that any shortcomings identified in the consultation process were sufficient to sustain any objections regarding the consultation's adequacy, the Committee noted that the continued reference by objectors to their concerns in this area illustrated the lack of trust between objectors and the promoter. We continued to be concerned about adequate protection for the site to ensure that it could not be used for any purpose other than the proposed educational function. At consideration stage, therefore, an amendment was lodged by Alison McInnes the intention of which was to ensure that, if the park is appropriated under the terms of the Bill and then ceases to be used for educational purposes, it will revert to its legal status and be subject to the title restriction on its use at the time of cessation of use. The amendment is also allowed for circumstances where the appropriation occurs, but, for whatever reason, the park is not used for educational purposes. In such a case, if the park were not used for that purpose within a period of 10 years, if, for example, school premises were not provided, the legal and title restrictions would once again apply to the park when that period expired. The bill, the bill has now been amended to include the terms of that amendment. In terms of replacement of open space promised by the Council, which will be formed from part of the existing combined site of Portobello High School and St John's Primary School, objectors voice concerns about the site being out with the local vicinity, being smaller than the space which would be lost and being beside an existing park. The Council's commitment to the provision of open space was also questioned, as was the protection which would be provided by fields and trust status, which the Council intends to seek for the replacement site. 
The committee had previously urged the Council to consider whether there are any other additional members which could be taken to allay concerns about the security of their placement open space future. In response, the promoter provided details of the other possible measures which it had considered and had concluded that none of these measures would provide additional protection at this stage. The preferred solution remained the designation of the land as fields and trust status. The Council stated at the committee meeting on the 7th of May that, in the circumstances, fields and trust protection is the best proposal for allaying any concerns that objectors might have. We are content that this designation should provide a satisfactory additional safeguard for the future of the site. On the objectors themselves, the committee took account of each one and its own merits and circumstances. However, there were a number of clear themes which featured consistently. The main issues arising included the loss of amenity and green space, road safety, traffic and congestion issues, the visual impact of the proposed development, including loss of views, the height of the building and lighting, and a number of environmental issues such as noise pollution, operational disturbances and loss of wildlife and biodiversity. I would wish to highlight that in relation to the mitigation measures which might be sought to alleviate concerns in connection with these issues, the promoter asked objectors, including at evidence sessions, what proposals they had that might mitigate their concerns. In the context of the bill being passed and the school being constructed on the park, objectors argued that the only mitigation measures would be, would be for the school to be built on another site. In conclusion, the committee has spent over 12 months considering the issues pertaining to this divisive bill and is disappointed that there has not been a greater degree of constructive resolution and engagement between the parties. We acknowledge the objector's concerns on various fronts. For example, there will inevitably be adverse impacts due to noise and operational disturbance. There will be a visual impact from the construction of the building itself and some loss of view to Arthur's seat. And there are indeed health benefits to be derived from open space, which the park provides. However, the committee also recognises that there will be compensatory and mitigating measures implemented as required by the planning process, that there are other green and open spaces in the vicinity, and there will be other benefits to the community from the new sporting facilities. Overall, we are satisfied that an appropriate balance has been struck between the private interests of those adversely affected by the proposal and its benefits to the wider community. I move that the City of Edinburgh Council Portable Park Bill be passed. Many thanks. Now call on Derek Mackay, Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In opening, I would like to acknowledge the work of the Bill Committee in considering the Bill and the efforts of those who have given written submissions for oral evidence. As I said when I spoke in the preliminary stage debate on the Bill in January, as is the case with such matters, the Scottish Government has taken a neutral position on the Bill. The bill does not have uh, any direct impact on Scottish Government policy and the Government is content that the bill will not have any direct consequences for general law. Nor does this Government have a view on the merits of the proposed site as this is a matter for the Council. However, I recognise the widespread agreement that the current Portobello High School building is not fit for purpose and needs to be replaced. I also recognise that the Council has identified land at Portobello Park as its preferred site for a replacement building, as well as the concerns of those who do not wish to see the park used for this purpose. None of these are issues for Scottish Government. These are local issues that should be resolved locally. The only reason why the matter has been brought to the Parliament is that following a decision by the Court of Session, the only way for the Council to achieve its preferred option for the replacement Portobello High School is to secure passage of a private bill. An important part of the Committee's consideration was around whether there has been a sufficient consultation by the Council on its proposals. In its preliminary stage report, it concluded that there had been inadequate consultation, but also that a number of issues had been raised about the detail of the consultation process. It therefore encouraged the City of Edinburgh Council to reflect on these issues. I share that sentiment. It is vitally important that local people should be properly consulted about and able to influence decisions that affect them. I would therefore encourage all local authorities, not just the City of Edinburgh Council, to consider these points made during consideration of the Bill and to make any changes to their own procedures that may be appropriate. In that context, I will say a brief word about the Scottish Government's Community Empowerment Bill, which was introduced earlier this month. The Bill's core purpose is to help communities to achieve their own goals and aspirations through ownership of land and buildings and by having their voices heard in the decisions that affect their area. It includes a requirement for local authorities to publish their proposals and consult community bodies before disposing of or changing the use of common good assets. 
I don't propose a wider redefinition uh, of common good assets. There can often be uncertainty about what constitutes common good land or the purposes uh, for which it can be used. The Community Empowerment Bill would therefore also place a statutory duty on local authorities to establish and maintain a register of all property held by them for the common good. Taken together, the provisions in the Bill would thus substantially improve transparency and accountability in relation to common good land. In conclusion, I think that the Bill Committee has given very careful consideration to these issues that have been raised during the progress of the Bill. And in particular, I note that the Committee has sought to address concerns about the future of the site by passing an amendment aimed at securing that if the land ceased to be used for educational purposes, it would revert to its original use and status. I think this is to be welcomed as being true to the core purpose of the Bill. However, I look forward to hearing what other members have to say this afternoon, and I, I emphasise once again that the Government continues to take a neutral position on the Bill. Many thanks. And I now call on Kezia Dugdale, five minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, can I add my thanks to the committee members and indeed the clerks who do the work behind the scenes? Um, when we last met to discuss this Bill, I expressed my frustration at the rules which precluded members who represent an area participating in a private bill process affecting it. I was worried that my colleagues would not understand the complex and long-standing community interest in this issue, that they would be cold to the arguments from both sides and simply go through the motions without an affinity for the community in question. On reflection, that was exactly what was needed. And I'd like to commend the committee members and the clerks for their dedicated but dispassionate approach to this bill. For they have examined the detail in great depth and have often delved into the detail beyond the strict application of the Bill, producing a report which is thorough, robust and a credit to this Parliament. I have received a number of emails from people opposed to the Bill questioning the Committee's integrity. Each email follows the same format, highlighting the same key points. It feels coordinated in a way that many charity-led campaign emails do, just without their paralleled numbers. That same email says that MSPs across Scotland were being told to vote in favour of the bill before any evidence was heard, and that there is clear evidence that this bill is being rushed through as a political decision and not being considered on its merits. I have to categorically refute those suggestions. There is no Labour whip in place for this afternoon's vote, and I understand that every other party represented in this chamber has taken that same decision. So I say to my colleagues across the chamber who have perhaps yet to make up their minds, I will be voting for the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Park Bill at 4.45 this afternoon and I'll do so with every confidence that it represents the majority will of the community. There is substantial evidence of community support in the preliminary report and in the consideration stage report published last month. But let me add to that the reality of my five years of solid campaigning in this constituency, speaking to thousands and thousands of voters face to face on their doorsteps. I know the community want this school and they want it on the park. I'll say a bit more about the community in my closing speech, but would like to spend the last few moments of this opening examining the suggestion put forward by the objectors that this bill will somehow set a precedent on common good land. The email from objectors states that because there are no plans to reform common good legislation, this bill, if passed, will allow other councils to take common good land for any purpose they wish. Can I say that it's exactly because this bill is so narrowly defined that no precedent is set? The law of common good remains unchanged should Parliament vote in favour this afternoon, except for the specific instance of Portobello Park. Paragraph Paragraph 38 of the consideration report could not be clearer in that regard. The final point made regularly in emails from objectors is that the Parliament is overruling a judgment of the courts. The committee have ably addressed this point by highlighting the role of the courts as interpreting and implying the law as it stands. Parliament has the power to legislate as it considers appropriate, even if the effect is to change the law as determined by a court. In the simplest terms, presiding officer, that is democracy. The committee has also addressed the ECHR issue and I understand that objectors are considering that as their next legal move. 
The committee report notes a fair balance has been struck between the competing interests of those adversely affected by the scheme and the benefits to the wider community. The principle of proportionality has been applied and I would ask the objectors to consider that concept of proportionality when considering their next attempt to block the school. To end the beginning, presiding officer, can I just reiterate my thanks to my diligent colleagues who have seen the committee since its establishment and urge my colleagues in the chamber to vote based on the strength of the consideration report and in no doubt that the vast majority of community support sees this bill progressing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Gavin Brown. Uh, five minutes or so, Mr Brown, and invite all the other members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, I'm grateful. Uh, thank you for that. I'm grateful to, uh, the, to the convener uh, for her remarks and also for the tone of her remarks uh, over the course of the debate, but also, I think, for the way in which the committee approached, which I think was a pretty uh, difficult task. There was uh, a range of evidence to look at. There were some complex issues, I think, uh, for committee members to get their head around, and there was a great de degree of contention uh, between the promoters of the bill and those who were quite rightly, uh, in their view, objecting to the bill. And that process, I think, had to follow the form that it did. And I think the committee did that um, uh, quite properly and particularly well. Um, we heard the memorandum from the uh, promoter's bill read out earlier to address the legal obstacle which is currently preventing the new Portobello High School being built on Portobello Park with the aim of reclassifying the park as alienable common good land for the purposes of the Local Government Scotland Act of 1973. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, there have been, I think, a couple of items of significant progress over the course of the last year, which has certainly, uh, I think, encouraged me and made my mind up for voting, voting in favour of the bill at uh, a decision time today. The first one is the firm commitment that was given to designate the existing site as a new park or recreation facility and give it fields and trust status. While that is not a statutory provision, I think it does provide a degree of safeguard and I think does um, weaken some of the arguments against the bill. Uh, secondly, I think, as was referred to already, the amendment in the name of Alison McInnes at the consideration stage restricts matters somewhat um, so that the bill can effectively only do what it says on the tin. It doesn't give any wider scope uh, to the City of Edinburgh Council or indeed any other council. And I think those two items are quite important that I think tip the balance in favour, in my view, of the bill being passed. Now, like many others, I think, within this chamber, I've had a number of uh, contacts from constituents and those who are not constituents, um, criticising the bill and making challenges against it. And I think it's, it's worth just dealing with some of those and looking at them in a bit of detail. And one of the complaints is that the bill is being rushed through and I don't think rushing through legislation is a very good thing, and that's a charge that has to be looked at seriously. But I did compare the timescale of this bill to the timescale of several other bills that are currently going through Parliament, and I have to say I don't think the timescale is particularly different from those other bills. Uh, this bill uh, was lodged on the 25th of April 2013, went through its first stage, the preliminary stage, in January of this year, the consideration stage earlier in June, and today at its final stage, obviously, um, the end of June. So a time scale of um, one year uh, and two months, approximately. If you look at something like the Housing Scotland Bill, which again is a pretty complex piece of legislation, which we spent a considerable time uh, considering looking at in the Chamber yesterday, that was initially lodged on the 21st of November 2013. It went through um, its first stage at the end of April went through stage two earlier this month and, of course, was passed um, yesterday. So actually a, a shorter time scale um, for the Housing Scotland Bill than we had for the Portobello Park Bill. Compare it with another bill um, that is going through Parliament, uh, again, a very complex piece of legislation, the Revenue Scotland uh, and Tax Powers Bill. That was lodged um, just before Christmas of last year, went through stage one in May, it went through stage two a couple of weeks ago. And while we don't have a final date, uh, to my knowledge, I understand it's coming to the Chamber probably in August of this year. So again, a slightly shorter timescale uh, than we had for the Portobello uh, Park Bill, the City of Edinburgh Council, 
Portobello Park bill. So I think the, um, the argument that it's rushed through is one that people can make, but I, but I think when I compare it to other bills, I'm not sure that one uh, stands up. Um, in terms of the, the idea of lack of scrutiny, again, I didn't sit through the evidence session, so I think objectors are quite um, valid to put those points forward. But again, on looking at the, um, the official report of at least some of those evidence sessions, given the number of evidence sessions that took place over the 14 months, and indeed some of the length of those evidence sessions, um, again, it doesn't strike me as particularly different from other bills that have gone through that have been looked at uh, by other committees. And I think Kezia Dugdale touched on the issue, but I'll, I'll close on this. In terms of setting a precedent, I mean, again, I don't, I'm not convinced that it does set a precedent. It is very, very tightly defined in terms of uh, the coordinates uh, within uh, Portobello Park. Um, I think the idea that lots of council would be able to, again, bring private bills to this chamber, I think, would, would be unlikely. I think you'd reach capacity issues uh, for a start within the parliament. And so for those reasons, I don't think it does set a precedent. And uh, I think, as I said already, I'll be uh, supporting the bill at come decision time. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move to open debate. And I call on Fiona MacLeod, uh, five minutes or thereby, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I rise to speak as a member of the committee that looked at this private bill. I want to concentrate my remarks on reassuring MSPs um, in the Chamber and those who are following this debate in their offices. Uh, given the number of emails that they've received and many of the assertions that have been made in them, I would like to reassure all members that when they come to vote, this afternoon at uh, 4.45, that this committee conducted itself in an exemplary fashion. Now, I say that having been the convener of a previous private bill committee, the National Trust for Scotland Private Bill Committee, so I do understand how private bill committees uh, have to conduct themselves. And this, con this committee conducted itself in an exemplary fashion. All submissions from all parties were very carefully considered by all members of this committee at length and in great detail. When the committee needed clarification, they asked for it from all parties, whether objectors or promoters. And as some of the other uh, members who've talked in this debate have said, we added extra, an extra meeting in to ensure that witnesses got as much time as possible to give the evidence that they thought this committee had to hear. Indeed, one extra meeting was put in that met at half past eight in the morning to ensure that we had a timetable that should have meant we did not have to cur curtail any witness giving evidence. So we had the timetable and we had the time if the witnesses um, could have stuck to that. And also, as the convener has said, we issued two reports uh, at the end of our deliberations at preliminary stage and at consideration stage, not something that is always done by a private bill committee. So at all points in this process and at all meetings of this committee, every member took their duties seriously and worked accordingly. The convener did not have an easy job and in her opening statement, she gave her thanks to the other committee members, to the clerks and the parliamentary officers who supported us. And I'm sure I am speaking on behalf of my other committee members in thanking the convener for helping us through this long process. But I would also like to record my thanks to the clerks and the parliamentary officers for the support that they gave us in coming to a clear understanding of what of the process we were going through and the decision that we reached. But, presiding officer, one of the assertions that has been in the emails that I would particularly like to address is that at the preliminary stage and today, there was a whipped vote on this. Now, presiding officer, you know that I am a member of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee of this parliament, and I take that role as seriously as I did my role on this private bill committee. But further to that, presiding officer, I'm also the senior government whip. And I want to make it absolutely clear that neither at preliminary stage nor at the final stage today was this party in any way whipped or influenced 
so that the individual members of the Scottish National Party will make their vote today based on their consideration of the reports of this committee that were done with care and with due consideration. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I would like to say to my fellow MSPs that they can be confident in the reports of this committee. They can be confident that they were robustly, uh, everything was robustly examined and that these reports will be an excellent way of, of um, you know, supporting evidence in aiding each individual member of this parliament to make their decision today on whether this bill should proceed to conclusion. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you. And now call on Alison McInnes, five minutes or thereby, please. Thank you very much, uh, deputy presiding officer. The very nature of the private bill process in that it rightly gives objectors a proper process for their views to be heard, does tend to emphasise the negative. And after months of considering objections, members of the committee would be forgiven for thinking that no one supported the Council taking this course of action. So Kezia Dugdale's speech this afternoon was, was very welcome in reminding um, those of us in the Chamber of just how much support in the community there is for this course of action. All members will have received emails, and some other members have already re referred to that, over the last week from objectors urging them to vote against the bill today. In those emails, objectors claim, and I quote, the bill has not been properly scrutinised, evidence has been ignored, and objections have been dismissed without even being heard, end quotes. Others complain that the bill is being rushed through, and some suggest that the outcome of the bill process was agreed before it even started. Well, I say to colleagues around the Chamber, as a member of the committee who has invested, I would say, countless hours in the process over the last 13 months, I completely refute those claims. I believe that all members of the committee carried out their duties objectively and conscientiously. Um, we set out our views in very detailed way in two separate reports, the preliminary stage report and our consideration stage report. And it's appropriate at this point to take the opportunity to thank the clerks who've supported us in this process. The bill was introduced in April 2013 and the committee has been dealing with the consideration stage of this bill since January. That's hardly rushing at it. The procedures followed by the committee ensured that the promoter and objectors had a fair opportunity to have their respective cases presented. I think it's worth emphasising that because objections were not upheld by the committee, this does not in any way reflect that the committee did not take into account all of the concerns which were put forward in the objections. Indeed, the committee considered the issues raised in a number of ways. Through the consideration of individual objections themselves, by giving every objector the opportunity to submit supplementary written evidence at consideration stage, and by ensuring that every objector had the opportunity to be represented by a lead objector at oral evidence stage uh, sessions. In a number of areas, the committee acknowledged or accepted that it was possible that there could be a detrimental effect on objectors' private interests as a result of the construction of the school. For example, we accepted that there would inevitably be some adverse impact from operational disturbance while the school was being constructed and also thereafter. However, we were also satisfied that this had been subject to the planning process and that measures would be implemented to mitigate any such impact. Our role as a private bill committee was to reach a view on the extent to which an individual's private interests would be affected and the extent to which this was balanced by the general benefit to the wider community as a result of the school being built. And we ultimately concluded, as the convener has said, that taking account of factors such as the compensatory and mitigation measures which would be implemented, that the general benefits which would be brought to the community as a result of the proposal were more significant than the private interests of those who might be adversely affected. As the convener has already explained, only one amendment was lodged during phase two by myself, and it was agreed unanimously. Clause 2A of the now revised bill ensures that having changed the status of the park for the limited purposes in question, should that use cease, then the inalienable common good status would reapply automatically. 
and it provides safeguards for any future use of the land and protects its inalienable common good status in circumstances where the land is no longer used for an educational purpose or indeed if it is not actually taken up for that in the first instance. In closing, presiding officer, it is worth remarking on the apparently polarised positions of the parties involved with this private bill. There is clearly much to be done by the Council to rebuild trust within some sections of the community. There is an opportunity to do that in taking forward the replacement open space. Getting everyone involved to shape the exact nature of that provision could, go, could be a way to bring the different factions together around a positive outcome for the community. If this bill is passed today, and I for one will be supporting it, I really do hope that the energy and the determination that objectors have so far spent on trying to prevent the school being built on the park perfectly legitimately is now harnessed to ensure that the community of Portobello does get the school that it so badly needs. Many thanks. I now call on Alison Johnson, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, firstly, I'd like to note my interests as a City of Edinburgh councillor from 2007 to 11, a current Lothian's MSP and a board member of Fields and Trust. And I too would like to thank the members of the committee and the clerks who supported them in their deliberations. As an Edinburgh councillor, I visited Portobello School and frankly was appalled by the condition of the building. Learning and teaching in this poorly designed and poorly maintained building is needlessly challenging. If Portobello School had been properly designed in the first place and a meaningful life cycle maintenance budget allocated, we might not be here today. And I know that those who oppose building on the park also wholeheartedly agree that Portobello does need a new high school. Passions have run high in this debate because our parks and our schools are amongst our most precious, our most important community assets. And this is a community that cares deeply about these assets. City of Edinburgh Council obtained advice from senior council in 2008 that advised them to seek the court's permission to appropriate Portobello Park before taking any action. But this expert advice was not made known, and it's only come to light as a result of a Freedom of Information request. The council should have established, without a shadow of a doubt, that they could build on the park. Offers to share costs to do so weren't taken up, and this ongoing lack of clarity lengthened the debate around the future of the school and the park by some years. Presiding officer, we're now years down the line and we must ensure the best possible outcome for the entire community. My amendment committing the City of Edinburgh Council to provide an area of replacement parkland for that lost if the bill is enacted wasn't selected for debate this afternoon, but you can see it in Tuesday's business bulletin. The people of Portobello want and need a new high school, somewhere that their young people can flourish and learn. And the people of Portobello also need certainty that their environment and their quality of life won't be diminished. And I fully understand why there are community concerns around this issue, as the City of Edinburgh Council has changed its mind previously regarding the provision of replacement open space, and making part of the Bill's provisions would provide greater protection and recognition at a national level. That said, Green councillors in City of Edinburgh Council, via an addendum lodged, have ensured that the Council will secure the replacement park with Fields and Trust status. I sit on the Fields and Trust Scotland Board, as I mentioned, and I am reassured that this protection is formally in process with the City of Edinburgh Council, both for the golf course at Portobello Park and for the new open area where the school currently stands. And it's worth noting that there's been no challenge to any site protected by Fields and Trust since they were formed in the 1920s. And they have always successfully negotiated for appropriate replacement provision in cases where councils have approached them. I will be supporting the bill at this final stage. Despite not being part of the bill's provisions, there are assurances in place for the replacement park and I also welcome the consideration stage amendment from Alison McInnes on protecting the land's legal status should it cease to be used for education. There are lessons to be learned from this experience and process, not least about how we design our schools in the first place 
Are we, are we seriously maintaining them? Are we putting funds aside to make sure that they don't deteriorate to the state Portobello finds itself in? But in closing, I look forward to the arrival of a school that pupils in Porto, Portobello deserve, a school that the community can be proud of. And I look forward too to the provision of quality open space, which will genuinely enhance the quality of life and people in Portobello. And I do hope that in the future, the community can regain the cohesion that makes Portobello such a special place to live in. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to the closing speeches, and I call on Gavin Brown. Uh, up to five minutes, Mr Brown. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I think this has been a pretty constructive uh, debate, and I was struck by the contributions of a number of members throughout the course of the debate. Fiona McLeod, I think, gave her experience of previously chairing a private bill committee, so she has something, I think, directly uh, comparable. Perhaps that bill was a little um, less, contest less contentious, uh, but nonetheless, I think she has experience in that particular uh, part of legislation. Um, and I think she also carefully explained, I think, the way in which the committee had worked and tried to take into account all of the uh, competing interests, whether that be um, accepting all supplementary evidence in a written form, whether it's uh, organising an extra meeting and whether it's changing the hours uh, planned for meetings to try and make sure that all witnesses are able to give um, everything they want to say and to put it out there on the table. I was struck also by the, the contribution from Alison McInnes and, and one of her comments in particular, she said, just because you don't uphold a complaint doesn't mean you haven't taken it into account. And I think objectors to the bill, and certainly in reading the consideration stage report, may well feel um, that uh, the committee didn't consider things because none of the uh, complaints were upheld on, in their entirety. But I think in a number of occasions, and a number of speakers have pointed out, um, the committee did acknowledge, I think, where there were disadvantages. I think the committee uh, carefully also then laid out why they felt the complaint uh, shouldn't be upheld because the disadvantages that they acknowledged were superseded by advantages that were brought forward by doing that too. Alison McInnes also said, I think quite right, that the council does have a job to do here. It's not just the job of building a school, it is the job of rebuilding trust throughout the community. And I think that all, most contributors have acknowledged that certain parts of the process by the council, um, while potentially described as adequate, were not what they should have been and not to the standard that I think um, people were entitled to expect, and they have to learn lessons from that going forward. But Alison Johnson, I think in her contribution, I think touched on a really important issue too, the idea, allowing us all to focus on the conditions at Portobello High School. She was appalled by the conditions. This is a school, I think, which has thrived, um, but a school which perhaps the original design uh, was flawed, perhaps the maintenance hasn't been what it ought to have been, but despite all of that, a school that I think has, has succeeded enormously, and that is a real tribute uh, to the students, uh, to the teachers, and to the parents uh, of those students as well. But if, thinking about the success of that school in the conditions in which it has had to uh, operate, imagine what that school would be capable of achieving were it to have a building and were it to have the facilities that it deserves and merits. And I think that is one of the reasons why there is wide support for the bill. In terms of the emails that we will have had over the last week or two, um, we've had very few, if any, uh, from those in support of the bill. But I think one of the contributions made in an email made it clear that there was a deliberate uh, attempt not to uh, send um, emails to MSPs from those in favour of the bill. There was one email um, on behalf of everybody who was in favour of the bill. But certainly in terms of the consultation, certainly in terms of the public meetings, it's pretty clear to me that there is a majority and quite a substantial majority in favour uh, of the bill and has, more wide, has support more widely. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, I think uh, in closing, the, the committee said that they had attempted to achieve a fair balance between the competing interests of those adversely, effective, adversely affected and the benefits to the wider community. I think they looked at it ver very carefully. I think they did uh, take complaints into account and I think they decided on balance um, without division that the bill ought to be passed and the bill ought to proceed 
and that they felt the benefits to the wider community uh, were greater. Um, and on that basis, uh, they felt they ought to go forward. And again, as I think as I indicated earlier, on that basis, I'll be supporting the bill uh, come decision time. Thank you. Many thanks. Now call on Kezia Dugdale. Five minutes or thereby, please, Ms Dugdale. Thank you, President Officer. Um, it is, of course, our, our last day of term, and instead of getting the, the board games out, we are, of course, here discussing a, a very important issue. I think it's work, worth recognising how full the gallery is, and I'd like to, to welcome a number of community councillors who are in the gallery this afternoon, uh, the chair of the PFANS campaign and a number of PFANS members, uh, my Labour colleagues Joan Griffiths and Maureen Child, who are both councillors for the school catchment area, and I've also seen the outstanding head teacher uh, Peggy MacArthur in the gallery. There, there are many other uh, local residents in the gallery and watching online. Perhaps they're watching the debate through the Talk Porty Twitter account or through the Facebook page uh, for Portobello for a New High School on the Park, which has over 2,500 followers. This is a real community spirit, evidence and support for the school on the park. In the preliminary stage debate, I shared with the Chamber the story of Jessie, whose mum and dad I'd met whilst trapping doors in the area. Uh, Jessie challenged me to take a tour of the school with her, and I did that, recognising how important it was to see the school through the eyes of the child. Jessie was in primary two at Tower Bank Primary School when she was first promised a new school. She will most likely leave Portobello High School with a complete set of hires in the current building. She spent an educational lifetime waiting for a new school and it will likely pass her by. She's had a first class education at Portobello High School though, every failing of the building overcompensated by the determination of the staff to deliver that first class education. I'd like to pay tribute to the head teacher Peggy MacArthur for leading the school, a school pounding with life, culture, sport and opportunity. She's never let the achievements of the school be overshadowed by the challenges of the building and for that she must be commended. I was last in the school last week to see the school show, uh, uh, Schools Will Rock You, and I was blown away by the talent of the pupils and the dedication of the staff involved in that production. But there was a sense of make do and mend, you know, um, lots of plugs for the um, equipment all jammed into the one place, the windows blacked out. And I contrasted that with another visit to a school I had last week in Dunfermline, the new Dunfermline High School, where they have a, a dedicated theatre space in the school with all the rigging and all the fancy stuff that many an Edinburgh Festival theatre venue would be envious of. Dunfermline High School also has dedicated 3G pitches. And I think of the bus trip that the schools take at Portobello High School to get to the Jack Kane Centre for PE. They have, the provision for PE is so poor at Portobello, they have a special dispensation for the two hours of PE target, and they've had it for years. I look at the bright, airy, spacious school in Dunfermline, in Dunfermline and contrast it with the stairwells at Portobello, which are so cramped and fraught. Timetabling of classes at the school are attributed around the, uh, the traffic in the stairwells Kids have to minimise the amount of time the kids spend walking uh, through the stairwells from class to class. I'm not envious of Dermot de Fermlin High School or jealous. I I'm proud of it. I'm proud that we have a school befitting the ambitions of the pupils and the teachers of that school. And I want it for everyone. I want it for Portobello. I want a first-class community school despite its building, not because of it. A new school which will be a community asset and in my view and in the view of a number of members in the chamber, an enriching one. But just going back to that report, it it's not a black and white report. The consultation was not perfect. The committee report recognises that. But as it says, the committee does not consider that any shortcomings identified in the consultation process are sufficient to sustain any objection regarding the consultation's adequacy. It's back to this concept of proportionality. It's not a question of whether the consultation was flawed, but whether any flaws were considered serious enough. The same goes to the minor loss of green space, views or house prices. Never a question of the validity of these arguments, but whether they constitute enough of a reason to block the school on the park. And you have to look at the conclusion of the report. And, and I think it's quite unusual comment for a committee to note how polarised the parties involved in this bill are. And Alison McInnes made this point. There's a strong message from the committee to the community to find a way through this. President Officer, if we think the referendum debate is fractious and divisive, it has nothing on the debate around the school and the community. 
And I hope that the journey towards reconciliation and the future will start today with a vote of this parliament in favour of the school on the park. With that, I understand that the shovels could be in the ground as soon as September and a new school could be ready for the start of the 2016 term. I hope that's an ambition we can all realise today. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Minister Derek Mackay, up seven minutes or thereby, Minister. Thank you, uh, Presiding Officer, uh, which is something of a challenge when you have to remain neutral throughout uh, the debate, uh, as is the case with these matters, but I will absolutely uh, do uh, my best. Uh, I think this has been a very consensual and constructive uh, debate and focused on, on a number of areas. It first and foremost, surely has to be the consideration of the pupils who are being educated in a building that is clearly no longer fit for purpose, and finding a solution for that has been central to everyone's considerations. But it would be remiss of me uh, not to, of course, remind the, the Chamber of the new uh, monies made available uh, in terms of the announcement earlier today, just to make the point that further new investment will go into Scotland's school estate in partnership with local authorities. This issue was not necessarily about resourcing, but options available to move forward in terms of, of that uh, new site. I think uh, Siobhan McMahon's contribution was excellent in going into uh, great depth on, on the factors and the issues uh, involved and how we have to separate out all the different considerations, what is relevant for a planning authority or different to how a, con a council considers its estate management uh, issues as well as the legal uh, uh, status uh, involved and of course at no point dismissed objections and views but balances them out and essentially takes a, a decision and in that respect calls for enhancing the legislation around uh, common good. I believe we will do that through the, the Community uh, Empowerment Scotland Bill but it won't be a wholesale revisiting of common good legislation because that in its end, itself I fear would create so many unintended consequences as we try and rewrite hundreds of years of history of of legislation, but absolutely greater transparency and community involvement will feature uh, in that bill in terms of common good assets, which run to hundreds of millions of pounds across Scotland. And I should say there were those within the state, uh, those within, for example, local authorities that say common good funds are overly bureaucratic and they should just be wound up and rolled into mainstream council funding. Well, I've decided that's not the appropriate approach to take. They are communities inheritance and there should be a degree of protection. And that's also why all members have been right to point out this does not set a legal precedent, a new way, a new channel uh, for adjusting common good funds. Any council would have to go through this process to achieve this outcome. And I think I have to restate that from the point of view of the government and like Gavin Brown and others I really do not see a great rush from local authorities to come to the Scottish Parliament to get similar uh, legislation even where they have the, the aspiration uh, to conduct uh, a similar uh, exercise. Uh, in terms of Kezia Dugdale's uh, point I think that the quality, a number of points, the quality of education being central, a thorough approach, delving into the detail, a robust consideration and determined to make this work and she said uh, uh, Kezia Dugdale said that the Labour Party wasn't whipped and Fiona MacLeod instructed and reminded us, of course, that neither are SNP members whipped. I don't think any party has whipped the, their, their members. And the same for the Liberal Democrats uh, uh, and, and the two Greens. So I think it is the case that members are free to vote uh, with their, their head and their, and their heart, of course, uh, on this one, without, without um, a, any precedent. And Kezia Dugdale once again reminded a very human story of why the new school is so necessary. Uh, Gavin Brown pointed out why it is a very difficult uh, task. It has been a contentious issue. Just like the planning system, this is about balancing out uh, different interests and coming to uh, the conclusion that's right in terms of public benefit and, and overall uh, benefit. And also covered the, the issue of uh, timescales in the bill uh, as well, ensuring that it's had careful uh, consideration. Uh, Fiona MacLeod um, pointed out again that all submissions have been very carefully considered. That's what we would expect from uh, committee work. And the, she reminds us that convener doesn't have a, an easy job. Well, I tell you, when you're Minister for Local Government and Planning, responsible for all decisions, it can be difficult when balancing out all these different issues, uh, as the member knows. But at some point, we have to reach uh, a decision and then justify uh, those uh, decisions. Alison McInnes uh, reminds us uh, of the support that does exist uh, in terms of uh, the bill, uh, as well as the views of the objectors, and also how the planning process sets into place 
conditions that are necessary and relevant in any planning application, and, and specifically uh, this one uh, as well. And of course, that Clause 2A amendment does provide uh, the safeguards around future use as well, which was a key concern uh, from many uh, of the objectors and, and, and the residents. And, and similar to a number of members hope that the progression of uh, this issue, whatever the outcome from this day on, can build bridges and, uh, and reconnect, including the, the city of, of Edinburgh Council and how they engage with the community uh, going forward, whatever the outcome of today's uh, vote. Now, um, Alison Johnston covered the condition of the building getting the best possible outcome. And I have to say, as a sometimes, sometimes critic of Edinburgh City Council, I do note uh, that um, you've also expressed a clear view uh, on the outcome uh, of, of the bill as well. And with your green credentials, you will pursue the issue of open space uh, as well, which was made uh, loud and clear. So in terms of common good, further enhancing of the transparency and community involvement there, general ongoing uh, investment in the school programme, it will be for members to choose and members to decide on hearing the arguments, not just today, but throughout the course of the last year, what they think the right thing to do is. Today is the day we make a decision and then we move on, focusing on all the different interests that have been played out. And all I can say in terms of the correspondence I receive, sometimes very strong campaigns, are delivered to us as constituency MSPs, ministers, government and individual uh, parties. But we have to decide on what's right, not necessarily just in a basic numerical game, but how we have considered all the different factors to come to the right conclusion. And I will say this, even if it's inappropriate for me to do so, uh, on this issue, listening to the debate, the deliberations that we've heard, the information that has been shared, whatever members choose to do today, I believe that every member who's spoken and expressed such a well-informed opinion, our collective integrity is above question in this matter, because what we've put first and foremost to our mind is a fair process, an equitable hearing, pursuing the, the rights and the interests of individuals as well as general public good. And in that sense, I think it's been a very constructive debate, taking us forward to the conclusion of the bill and then the vote where members will choose what they think the right decision is for Portobello High School and the bill that's being presented to us. Thank you, Minister. I now call on James Dornan to wind up the debate. Uh, Mr Dornan, if you could continue to 444, I would be much obliged. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think. Uh, I'd like to start off by supporting the motion in the name of the convener and thanking my fellow committee members and those who have taken part in the debate today. As has already been mentioned, this has been a lengthy process taking over a year. We've held 14 meetings, including six oral evidence sessions to reach this point. I don't intend to rehearse everything that happened at the preliminary stage. We've already had that debate, and the convener has referred to it in her contribution this afternoon. But following a substantial amount of written evidence and having heard oral evidence from the promoter, supporters and objectors, the committee re recommended and the Parliament subsequently agreed the general principles of the Bill and that it should proceed as a private Bill, which takes us to the consideration stage. With 59 objections outstanding, the Committee considered long and hard what might be the best approach to scrutiny at that stage. The Convener has already outlined her approach to grouping objections. It may be worth noting in this respect that given the issues raised in the majority of objections were the same or similar, the Committee might have divided objections into just two, perhaps three groups. We consciously avoided this in the reasonable expectation that objectors living in different parts of the area around the park might envisage different degrees of adverse effect in respect of loss of immunity or traffic concerns, for example. So in order to maximise the opportunity for evidence, we agreed to six groups to ensure that all objectors had an increased opportunity to have their say. To further facilitate evidence from objectors, we also accommodated requests from objector groups to reschedule their proposed evidence sessions. Objections covered a range of issues, from loss of amenity to traffic and road safety issues and visual impact. I'll touch briefly on some of the points in the time I have available, but will note at this point that having considered all the written and oral evidence presented to us by the objectors and the responses and commitments received from the promoter in relation to compensatory and mitigation measures, the committee reached the view that the adverse effect on private interests of individuals, i.e. the objectors, was outweighed by the benefits which enactment of the bill and subsequent construction of the new school would bring to the local community. 
As has already been mentioned by others, we have discussed another concern presented by the objectors that this bill will create a precedent for other local authorities to follow suit and try to introduce bills which will have an impact on common good land in their area. This has been considered throughout the process and we remain of the view that this bill does not create a precedent as it relates solely to a particular area of land in a particular part of a particular city in Scotland. Any bills covering common good land elsewhere would, of course, require to be considered on their own merits and circumstances. The convener has referred to the compensatory measure of the creation of an area of replacement open space at the site of the current school, and I note that an amendment was lodged by Alison Johnson, as was discussed earlier, the effect of which would have been to bind the City of Edinburgh Council to provide such replacement open space by including this in the bill. I would echo the convener's point, though, that the committee was also keen to ensure that the Council provided such space, and we are satisfied with the promoter's commitment in this respect. For example, we note the full Council's commitment in 2012 to make provision for replacement parkland slash green space to be used for social and recreational purposes, and that these purposes be safeguarded by fields and trust status. We note also in March 2013 that the Council agreed to defer the question regarding the most appropriate use of that new open space within the parameters of social and recreational purposes to a local neighbourhood partnership for consultation. And finally, in written evidence to the Committee on 26 March, it was stated that the promoter's letter of 31 January 2014 confirmed the commitment to securing the area of replacement open space, offered to provide a further express undertaking to the Committee to that effect, and summarised the intention to secure fields and trust. On 6 February 2014, the Council's elected members unanimously approved giving fields, of trust, fields and trust a written undertaking to the effects that both the replacement open space and the remaining area of open space on the park will be dedicated as fields and trust. Presiding officer, let me now provide a flavour of some of the objectors' concerns. As I mentioned previously, a number of the groups had predominantly the same or similar concerns, such as a loss of amenity and visual and environmental impact. But, as the convener noted earlier, when objectors were invited by the promoter to put forward any ideas that might mitigate their concerns in these areas, they argued only that the school should be built elsewhere. The vast majority of objectors are Objectors argued that they would be losing a significant amenity which would impact on a variety of recreational activities if the park was appropriated for the Council's education functions. They supported this argument by suggesting that the loss of green space would have a negative impact on their health and well-being. The committee acknowledged that the loss of the park would represent a degree of loss of green space and recognised the general health benefits to be derived from such spaces. However, we noted that there were other parkland areas in Portobello we also recognised, as we had done at preliminary stage, that should the park be built on, there were planned compensatory measures in terms of replacement open space. We were content that issues of loss of amenity did not outweigh the benefits to the community of a new school in the park, particularly when considering that the local community will, where appropriate, have access to the sports leisure facilities that are proposed to go with the school. Objectors expressed concerns about the visual impact of the development, including loss of views, the height of the building and fencing. In response, the promoter argued that the visual impact had been taken into account as part of the planning process. One moment, Mr Dornan. Can members just settle down, particularly those that are just coming into the chamber, and let us hear Mr Dornan to his conclusion at 4.44. <laughs> Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. With, for example, the building being designed so as to retain views of Arthur's seat and the majority of fences being low and integrated within boundary planning. It was confirmed that the new football pitches would be floodlit, but the lighting would be designed to not spill out to neighbouring houses and planning consent was subject to the hours of use of the pitches being restricted. Objectors maintained that the development of the park would lead to a loss of wildlife and the removal of trees, which would cause a loss of habitat for birds and wildlife. The committee recognised these and other environmental impacts which would result from the development, but was satisfied with the promoter's references to compensation measures which would include additional planting and a condition to the planning permission requiring a detailed landscape and habitat management plan. Objectors who do not live in the immediate vicinity of Portobello Park or who do not live in Edinburgh at all were included in one group. Their concerns related primarily to issues covered at preliminary stage, the role of Parliament legislating subsequent to a Court of Session ruling, the precedent argument and alternative sites, but they also had some concerns regarding loss of amenity. The Committee took the view that while these objectors might experience some loss of amenity, it was clearly not at the same level as that potentially experienced by objectors in the immediate area of the park. Portobello Golf Course golfers objected as a special interest group. They principally had two concerns. 
health and safety and future use of the golf course. And health and safety, the objectors were concerned that there would be a risk to school pupils taking shortcuts across the golf course. Evidence presented by the promoter suggested that there would be mitigation measures to counter these concerns, such as appropriate fencing being put in place. On the future of the golf course, the objectors feared that a case might be made for development in the site. The promoter referred to previous assurances that there were no such plans. The committee was satisfied that the golf course did not form part of the area to which the bill applies, and mitigation measures had been proposed to protect both the users of the course and the school. In conclusion, the committee was satisfied that, while the bill itself does not authorise the construction of a new high school in Portobello Park, the removal of the legal obstacle currently preventing it will allow such development to go ahead. Having considered the evidence presented to it, including the mitigation measures and commitments provided by the promoter, the committee concluded that the benefits to results from the bill being enacted and the construction of the new school in the park outweigh any adverse effect on the private interests of the objector. And finally, presiding officer, I wish to put on my record my sincere thanks to Siobhan McMahon for her role as convener of the committee. Siobhan has fulfilled this role particularly diligently. Her handling of all the evidence was impressive. She demonstrated patience and flexibility in managing the oral evidence sessions giving witnesses ample opportunity to contribute, and she dealt with a really significant volume of written evidence and separate correspondence, much of which was unpleasant, to say the least. I support the motion in the convener's name that the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Park Bill be passed. Thank you, Mr Dornan. That concludes the debate on the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Park Bill. The next item of business is consideration of three parliamentary bureau motions I would ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motions number 10487 to 10489 on approval of SSIs on block. Moved. The questions on these motions will be put to decision time to which we now come. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion 10379 in the name of Siobhan Man McMahon on the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to, and the City of Edinburgh Council Portobello Bill is now passed. <laughs> I propose to ask a single question on motions number 10487 to 10489 on approval of SSIs. If any member objects to a single question being put, please say so now. The next question then is at motion numbers 10487 to 10489 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on approval of SSIs be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. Uh, enjoy your recess. I'm sure you're all going to be very, very busy and I'll see you again in four weeks' time. I now close the meeting.